Hello everyone, this is William Armstrong with a video that I'm reading off my phone as a secondary screen, but it says here, Chinese hackers have released a never before seen Linux backdoor. This article is written by Dan Gooden at Ars Technica on, on September 18th, 2023, 11.25 p.m. And this is from the biz and IT and security section of the site. I'm going to read it. It says here, researchers have discovered a never-before-seen backdoor for Linux that is being used by a threat actor linked to the Chinese government. Before I continue, note that this is Linux malware, that Linux is starting to have malware developed for, just like Windows and Mac has as well. Even though the old saying goes that Macs cannot get viruses, but it turns out that they can. Now they can. Macs, Intel Macs could get Virus is written for them when Mac started to become Intel based. I'm not too sure about the ARM based Macs, however, because I don't own a Mac. I own Windows PCs only, so I really don't know about the ARM Macs to my knowledge. I don't hardly because I never really owned an Apple M1. I never had, so I can never really tell you about that at all. It's highly unlikely that I'll ever own an Apple M1, but I'm going to continue. The new backdoor originates from a Windows backdoor named Prochilis. That's the name, which was first seen in 2013 by researchers from Arbor Networks, now known as NetScout. They said that Trochilis executed and ran only in memory, and the shinal payload never appeared on disks in most cases. This is like a diskless-based malware. Long story short, diskless-based malware is designed to run in memory without leaving any files present on the computer to avoid detection. It's like, it's like having, for example, it's like having WannaCry ransomware, except WannaCry is locally present on the computer encrypting files, but other types of malware that are diskless-based automatically run in memory without leaving any files behind. I'll continue. That made the malware difficult to detect. Researchers from NHS Digital in the UK have said that Trochilis was developed by APT10, an advanced persistent threat group linked to the Chinese government, it also goes by the names Stone Panda and Menu Past. Other groups eventually used it, and its source code has been available on GitHub for more than six years. Trochilis has been seen being used in campaigns that use a separate piece of malware known as Red Leaves. In June, researchers from a security firm, Trend Micro, and an encrypted binary found an encrypted binary file on a server known to be used by a group they had been tracking since 2021. By searching virus total for the file name libmonitor.so.2. Linux uses shared object files known as .so files, similar to DLL files in Windows, so to speak. The researchers located an executable Linux file named mkmon. This executable contain credentials that could be used to decrypt libmonitor.so.2 file and recover its original payload, leading to researchers to conclude that mkmon is an installation file that delivered and decrypted libmonitor.so.2. The Linux malware ported several functions found in Trochilis and combined them with a new socket secure socks implementation. The trend micro researchers eventually named their discovery spry socks with spry denoting its swift behavior in the added socks component. Spry socks implements the usual behavior capabilities including collecting system information, obtaining an interactive remote shell for controlling compromised systems, listing network connections, and creating a proxy based on the socks protocol for uploading files and other data between the compromised system and the hacker controlled command server. Following table shows some of the capabilities. I'm going to read out this long list. It has message ID 0x09 as gets machine information, as it noted. 0x0a as starts interactive shell. 0x0b as writes data to the interactive shell. 0x0d as stops interactive shell. 0x0e as lists network communications parameters, IP port, com name, connect type. 0x0f, it sends packet parameter target. 0x14 and 0x19 sends initialization packet. Initialization packet. 0x16 is generates and sets client ID. 
zero x seventeen list network connection parameters TCP port UDP port HTTP port listen type and listen port zero x twenty three is creates a SOX proxy zero x twenty four is terminate SOX proxy zero x twenty five is forward SOX proxy data zero x two a is uploads file parameters transfer ID and size. 0x2b gets file transfer ID. 0x2c is downloads file perimeter state transfer ID package ID and package count file size. 0x2d gets transfer status perimeter state transfer ID result package ID. 0x3c it enumerates files in the root directory forward slash. In Linux, note that the forward slash root is the entire root file to store all the folders and directories are stored like forward slash etc forward slash home, forward slash bin, forward slash user, forward slash lib, forward slash var, forward slash cache, forward slash temp, forward slash um, init, and all other things. So basically, Linux uses a file structure directory of forward slash root, and it branches down into multiple directories. Only the root account on Linux and Unix systems has the read and write access to the entire file system. Home users... Like, say, for example, if you create a home username, John Doe, on a Linux system, John Doe only has read and write permissions to their own home folder, not anyone else's home folder, or won't have read and write permissions to the entire root file system in Linux because of the way it's designed to be secured like that. Similar to Windows. Windows has its own MTFS file system that has security, meaning you have your own user folder in Windows that's labeled John Doe as the user folder in Windows, but only John Doe has access to the folders inside of their own folder on Windows, not outside of that folder. 0x3d is enumerate files and directory. 0x3e is delete child. 0x3f creates directory. 0x40 renames file. And then 0x41 does no operation. And 0x42 is related to operation 0x3c and 0x40 SRC path, desk path. I'm reading it off my phone at R's technical website. After decrypting the binary and finding spry socks, the researchers used information they found to search virus total for related files. The search turned, their search turned up a version of the malware with the release number version 1.1. The version trend micro found was 1.36, a later version. The multiple versions suggest that the baton was currently under development. The command and control server that SpriceOx connects to has major similarities to a server that was used in a campaign with a different piece of Windows malware known as Red Leaves. Like SpriceOx, Red Leaves is also based on Trochilus. Red Leaves, as that is. Strings that appear in both Trochilus and Red Leaves also appear in the SOX component that was when added to SpriceOx. The SOX code was borrowed from HP Socket a high-performance network framework with Chinese origins. Trend Micro is attributing spry socks to a threat actor as dubbed Earth Luska. The researchers discovered the group in 2021 and documented that it, documented it the following year. Earth Luska targets organizations around the world, primarily in governments in Asia only. It, uses so, it targets organizations around the world, but it's primarily governments Asia-based. It uses social engineering to lure targets into watering hole sites where targets are infected with malware. Besides showing interest in espionage activities, Earth Lucifer seems financially motivated with sites set on gambling and cryptocurrency companies. The same Earth Lucifer server that hosted Spry Socks also delivered the payloads known as Cobalt Strike and Winty. Cobalt Strike is a hacking tool used by security professionals and threat actors alike. Note that Cobalt Strike or Cobalt Strike is used by security researchers and threat actors, both as good, both good and bad purposes. It provides a whole suite of tools for shining and exploiting vulnerabilities Earth Lusco was using to expand its access after getting an initial toehold to to hold inside of an entire environment. Winty, meanwhile, is the name of both of the suite of malware that's been in use for more than a de decade, as well as the identifier for a host of distinct threat groups, all connected to the Chinese government's intelligence apparatus has been among the world's most prolific hacking syndicates. Monday's Trend Micro report provides IP addresses, file hashes, and other evidence that people can use to determine they've been compromised. 
I'll give you the TLDR, the long story short about this. I'm going to break it down for you. Okay. Basically, long story short, Linux had had some malware for it, some that's too far in between, but this is a Linux backdoor. I'll explain what Linux malware is. I'll explain it. I'll give you the TLDR. I'm going to read a Wikipedia article that explains about Linux malware. Linux malware includes viruses, trojans, worms, and other types of malware that affect the Linux family operating systems. Linux and Unix and other Unix-like computer operating systems are generally regarded as very well protected against, but not immune to computer viruses. <laughs> Wrong. Mac OS or Intel systems has had malware too. Linux vulnerability, like Unix systems, Linux implements a multi-user environment where users are granted specific privileges and there is some form of access control implemented. To gain control over a Linux system or to cause any serious consequences to the system itself, the malware would have to gain root access to the system. In the past, it's been suggested that Linux had so little malware because its low market share made it a less profitable target. Rick Moen, an experienced Linux system administrator, counters that. That argument ignores Unix's dominance in the number of non-desktop specialties, including web servers and scientific workstations. A virus Trojan worm author who successfully targeted specifically Apache HTTPD and Linux x86 web servers would both have an extremely targeted rich environment and instantly earn lasting fame, and yet it doesn't happen. In 2008, the quantity, or the quantity of malware targeting Linux was noted as increasing. Shane Corson, a senior technical consultant in Conspirac with Conspiracy Lab, said at the time, the growth in Linux malware is simply due to its increasing popularity, in particular as a desktop operating system. The use of an operating system is directly correlated to the interest by the malware writers to develop malware for that OS. Tom Ferris, a researcher with security protocols, commented on one of Kaspersky's reports stating in people's minds, if it's non-Windows, it's secure, and that is not the case. Oops. They think nobody writes malware for Linux or Mac OS X, but that's not necessarily true. So Mac OS X has had malware written for it too. It's just like Windows and Linux has had too. Some Linux users do not run Linux-based antivirus software to scan and secure do documents and email, which comes from or is going to Windows users. Security focus as Scott Graneman stated, some Linux machines definitely need antivirus software. Samba or NTFS servers for instance, may store documents in undocumented vulnerable Microsoft formats, such as Word and Excel that contain inappropriate viruses. Linux mail servers should run AV software in order to neutralize viruses before they show up in the mailboxes of Outlook and Outlook Express users. Be sure I continue. A Linux machine can infect a Windows machine directly. How it works is a Linux mail server can get an email with a virus in it that's targeted for Windows. When a Windows machine connects to a mail or Linux mail server, it can instantaneously cause a user to download a infected email from the Linux server to the Windows machine forward, like one direction, like one way, but not the other direction. A foul server that has a Windows executable file that is malicious is on the Linux side on the Linux server, but someone next to that file server with a Windows machine may end up accidentally downloading malware from the Linux server that direction forward. In this Wikipedia article, it'll say Samba or NFS servers can store documents that are undocumented in vulnerable Microsoft formats that can contain and propagate viruses that can do that. Because they're predominant, pre dominantly used on mail servers, which may send mail to computers running other operating systems. Linux virus scanners generally use definitions for and scan for all known viruses for all computer platforms. For example, the open source clam AV detects viruses, worms, and trojans, including Microsoft Office macro viruses, mobile malware, and other threats. Clam AV is available for Linux too, called Clam TK and things like that. So there's Clam AV for Linux. It works on Unix, Windows, Mac, Unix, AIX, BSD, HPUX, and all these other Unix and Mac platforms known as CLAM 
AV, or CLAM antivirus. CLAM AV, I remember seeing a CLAM win for Windows, but however, the effectiveness of CLAM AV is not that great. It's called CLAM win free antivirus. It was actually developed for Windows that is actually using the, um, the uh, free and open source antivirus tool written for Windows that provides a free graphical user, in graphical user interface to the CLAM antivirus engine. Now, CLAM AV kind of is, it kind of, it was designed for Windows 98 and newer, but it's not like a true antivirus because it's using the open source CLAM AV. There's a program called CLAM TK, which is designed for desktop environment it's called clam tk it was used written the tk widget toolkit using gtk interface it's called clam av and there's clam tk for linux clam tk is available for linux based systems directly for unix linux based type systems it's available in freebsd centos arch all debian for Linux, Alt Linux, Fedora, Gentoo Linux, Mint, Mandriva, OpenSUSE, PC Linux OS, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Ubuntu, as well as FreeBSD. That's what exactly Clam TK is available for. Let me go back to the article. Viruses and Trojan Horses. The viruses listed below pose a potential, although minimal, threat to Linux systems. And if an infected binary containing one of the viruses were run, the system would be temporarily infected as the Linux kernel is memory resident and read only. Any infection level would depend on which user with what privileges ran the binary. A binary run under the root account would be able to infect the entire system. Privilege escalation vulnerabilities may permit malware running under a limited account to infect the entire system. It is worth noting that this is true for any malicious program that is run without special steps to take into limit its privileges. It is trivial to add a code snippet to any program that a user may download and let this additional code download a modified login server, an open mail relay, or a similar program, and make this additional component run anytime the user logs in. No special malware writing skills are needed for this. Special skill may be needed for tricking the user to run the Trojan program in the first place. Yikes. The use of software repositories significantly reduces any threat of installation of malware as the software repositories are checked by maintainers who try to ensure that repositories malware are free. Subsequently, to ensure the safe distribution of the software, check sums are made available. These make it possible to reveal modified versions that may have been introduced, by example, given hijacking of communications using a man in middle attack or via a redirection attack such as ARP or DNS poisoning. I'll give you an example. Linux Mint a Linux distribution I discovered in 2009, rather, was affected by this. Let me just go to Linux Mint. Linux Mint is Ubuntu-based, and they've had an incident where they've had a bit of a um, a bit of a, a brief. This take place in February 20th, 2016. I'll read it. It says here the Linux Mint website was breached by unknown hackers who briefly replaced download link to a version of Linux Mint with a modified version containing malware. The hackers also breached a database of the website's user form. Linux Mint immediately took its server offline and implemented enhanced security configuration for their website and forum. Linux Mint and Ubuntu based distro in 2016 on February 2016, they actually were hacked briefly with the Linux Mint distro being replaced with a modified version and malware in it. So they got themselves breached through shore only once. It hasn't happened again. Back to the article. Careful use of these digital signatures provides an additional line of defense which limits the scope of attacks to include only the original author's package and release maintainers and possibility others with suitable administrative access depending on how the keys and checksums are handled. Reproducible builds can ensure that digitally signed source code has been reliably transformed into a binary application. Worms and targeted attacks. The classical threat to Unix-like systems are vulnerabilities in the network daemons such as SSH and web servers. Linux uses daemons, or daemons is a computer program, or daemon, however you want to pronounce it, called daemon, is a computer program that runs as a background process rather than being under direct control of an interactive user. 
Linux and Unix systems use daemons or demons, however you pronounce it, or daemon, a background process that runs direct in the background without direct control of a user. So Unix systems use daemons in the background. The background processes that run when the system boots, but are not controlled by the main interactive user, though. System D is a Linux daemon or a Linux system sysv like init thing that runs in the background called System D that most Linux distributions have started using System D instead of sysv in it. When Linux transitioned from system or sysv in it to System D, it caused quite a stir in the open source world about transitioning from system or from sysv to system d system d is newer and newer linux distributions called system d before linux used to use sysv init like an init system in the old linux days but newer linux distributions like newer versions and when system d was developed that's when a lot of linux just started dropping the old sysv init system for Linux and switch to system D. Now I'm going to read about the uh, worms and targeted attacks. The classical threat to Unix like systems are vulnerabilities and network demons such as SSH and web servers. These can be used by worms for attack or attacks against specific targets. As servers are patched quite quickly when a vulnerability is found, there have been only a few widespread worms of this kind. As specific targets can be attacked only through a vulnerability that is not publicly known, there is no guarantee that a certain installation is secure. Also, servers without such vulnerabilities can be successfully attacked through weak passwords. There's web scripts in this Wikipedia article that I'm going to read as well. I'll give you the TLDR at the end of this. Linux servers may also be used by malware without any attack against the system itself. Example, where example given web content and scripts are insufficiently restricted or checked and used by malware to attack visitors. Some attacks use complicated malware to attack Linux servers, but when the most get full root access, then the hackers are able to attack by modifying anything like placing binaries or injecting modules. This may allow the redirection of users to different content on the web. Typically, a CGI script meant for leaving comments could be by mistake allow inclusion of code exploiting vulnerabilities in the web browser. Buffer overrun. Older Linux distributions were, native, were relatively sensitive to buffer overflow attacks. If the program did not care about the size of the buffer itself, the kernel provided only limited protection, allowing an attacker to execute arbitrary code under the rights of the vulnerable application under attack. Programs that gain root access or even would launch by a non-root user via the set UID bit were particularly attracted to the attack. However, in 2009, most of the kernels include address space layout randomization or ASLR, enhanced memory protection and other extensions making such attacks more difficult to arrange. I'm gonna read about cross-platform cross viruses. This is gonna mention a virus called Bad Bunny. I'll read the short thing about it. Bad Bunny, also known as SB Bad Bunny dash A, Softboss and Star Office Bad Bunny McAfee, is a multi-platform computer worm written in several scripting languages and distributed as an openoffice.org document commonly named badbunny.odg containing a macro written in star basic. Discovered on May 21st, 2007, the worm spreads itself by dropping malicious script files that have checked the behavior of popular IRC programs, MIRC and XChat, causing to send the worm to other users. Effects, if the macro is open from the infected document, it displays the following message title back forward slash forward slash bad bunny backslash 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 body hey username you like my bad bunny and loads one of four different scripts named bad bunny dot js js bad bunny under windows bad bunny dot pl pearl bad bunny under linux unix or either bad bunny dot rb or bad bunny a or dot rb ruby bad bunny under mac os x upon loading the user is shown a nsfw image of a man dressed as a rabbit having NSFW with a scantily clad woman in the woods. Yikes. That's an example of bad bunny malware that was a off open office.org virus that would show an NSFW image of a man in a bunny suit doing NSFW with a woman in the woods, literally. That's an image of it. 
if you search bad bunny malware or bad bunny openoffice.org virus, you'll get results on it. Stuart Smith, the semantic, said or wrote the following. What makes this virus worth mentioning is that it illustrates how easily scripting platforms and extensibility plugins, ActiveX, etc., can be abused all too often. This is forgotten in the pursuit to match features with another vendor. The ability for malware to survive across, in a cross-platform, cross-application environment is particularly relevant as more and more malware is pushed out via websites. How long until someone uses something like this to drop a JavaScript infector on a web server regardless of platform? So there is such thing as cross-platform viruses that was launched inadvertently in 2007, or launched maliciously in 2007, rather, called the Bad Bunny virus that used OpenOffice.org. OpenOffice is actually a open source office suite similar to LibreOffice. There is LibreOffice as well. There's LibreOffice and OpenOffice. LibreOffice is currently used. I'm not sure about OpenOffice, but we just swipe on the phone on Google Chrome. Its predecessor was OpenOffice. The successor is LibreOffice. That's what it is. So LibreOffice and OpenOffice are both open source office programs that behave like Microsoft Office, but you don't really have to pay for LibreOffice or OpenOffice. You don't. They're free of open source. Microsoft Office requires payment or subscription, something like that. Social engineering. As in the case of with any operating system, Linux is vulnerable to malware that tricks the user into installing it through social engineering. In December of 2009, a malicious waterfall screensaver that contained a script that, in, that used the infected Linux PC in denial of service attacks was discovered. Long story short, Linux has had malware written for it. Few, far, and between. The one I read earlier in the video talks about a Linux backdoor that's never before seen. A vast AVG, Avira, Bitdefender, ClamAV, Komodo, CrowdStrike, Dr. Web, FProt, FSecure, Kaspersky, McAfee, Panda, Security, Softball, Symantec, and Trend Micro have written antivirus software for Linux too. They have Panda, the Panda company itself. Softball has also written antivirus software for Linux. Komodo did too. Symantec, AVG, Navast, and Bitdefender, they've all written Linux-based antivirus software. It's for Linux-specific threats. These applications look for actual threats to the Linux computers on which they're running. CHK rootkit, known as Check Rootkit, is a rootkit, a rootkit checker that checks for, for rootkit infections. It says here, Check Rootkit or CH Rootkit is a widely used Unix based utility designed for aid system administrators in examining their system for rootkits. And operating is a shell script that leverages common Unix Linux tools such as the strings and grep command. The primary purpose is to scan core system programs for identifying signatures and to compare data obtained from traversal, the portrait proc directory, the output derived from the PS process status command aiming to identify inconsistencies. It offers flexibility and execution, allowing it to function from a rescue disk, often a live CD, and provides optional alternative directories for executing its commands. These approaches enhance the check rootkit's reliance on the commands it employs. Check rootkit is a rootkit detector designed to scan for rootkits and malware. Modern rootkits deliberately try to deliberate, might have de deliberately attempt to identify target copies of the check rootkit program or adopt other strategies to elude detection by it. So most malware in rootkits can automatically, if they detect and identify that they're being analyzed, they may modify themselves or elude detection to avoid getting caught. There's a lot of different ones. Also there's force point or bit force point in volatility that detects Linux malware that analyzes using memory forensics tools. There are quite a few Linux malware and Unix-based malware. There's Mayhem, a 3264-bit Linux FreeBSD multifunctional botnet. There's Linux.RemMaten, a threat targeting the Internet of Things called Linux.RemMaten. Or Remanton. Actually, I'll read about what this is. This video is going to be very lengthy a little bit. 
Remington is a malware which injects Linux on embedded systems by brute forcing usually frequently used default username and password combinations from a list to order and infect the system. Remington combines the features of the Tsunami and Lizard Stressor, aka Torless malware families. The command and control for Remake 10 are handled by RC Communications, Internet Relay Chat. Additionally, the command and control is done by an actual IRC channel rather than only IRC protocol. This is an improvement over bots such as Tsunami and Torless, making Remake 10 a greater threat than both combined. To avoid detection, Remake 10 tries to determine the platform of a device to download the architecture appropriate component from the command and control server. Once the maintenance checks the device, it is able to perform such actions such as launching distributed denial service attacks or download more malware on a device. The maintenance is able to scan or remove competing bots on a system compromised by you. Right? There are different multiple Unix and Linux malware types. This one infects the Internet of Things devices for remaintain devices. That's a botnet. Mirai is another example of a Linux malware that is a DDoS botnet or distributed denial service botnet that spreads through internet or spreads through telnet service and designed to infect internet things and IoT devices. There's a lot of different ones. There's Linux Encoder 1, which is a ransomware that automatically was spotted in 2015 that targeted Linux users that automatically would encrypt trials similar to what CryptoLocker does, but the malware Linux encoder, known as ELF file encoder A and trojan.linux.ransom.a, don't have a deadline to pay the ransom and does not increase over time. There is a version that affects FreeBSD, and there is a Linux encoder.1 has been rebuilt on Mac called KeyRanger that infected Mac OS X devices, known as KeyRanger. Transmission, the program called Transmission was affected, a popular BitTorrent client. I'll read about the OSX malware that was in 2016. KeyRanger, also known as OSX KeyRanger.a, is a ransomware Trojan horse, Trojan horse targeting computers running Mac OS. This is back in 2016, though. This is discovered March 4th, 2016 by Palo Alto Networks. It affected more than 7,000 Mac users. KeyRangers are remotely executed on the victim's computers from a compromised installer for transmission, a popular BitTorrent client downloaded from the official website. It is hidden in the .dmg. DMG is a disk mounting image file known as .dmg for Mac OS X systems only. File under general.rtf. The .rtf is actually a Mac O format executable or file pack with UPX3.91. When users click these infected apps, their bundle executable transmission.app content Mac OS transmission will copy its it will copy this general RTF file to tilde for slash library for slash kernel service and execute this kernel service before any user interface appearing. It encrypts the files of RSA and RSA public key cryptography within the key for a decryption only stored in the attacker servers. The malware then creates a file called read under, readme underscore to underscore decrypt dot text in every shoulder. When the instructions are open, it gives the victim directions on how to decrypt the shiles, usually demanding a payment of one Bitcoin. The ransomware is considered to be a variant of the Linux ransomware Linux encoder dot one. This particular malware known as Key Ranger spread it through an infected transmission program for the official website being compromised. And then the Infected disk image or dot DMG was uploaded to look like the real transmission. Transmission is an open source Linux BitTorrent client that's available on Windows, Mac, and Unix like systems as well. But this one was infected back over a decade ago in early, or actually not a decade, but about 2016, it had an infection in it. Palo Alto Networks added ransomware.keyranger.osx to their virus database two days after they published a description to break down of the code. If you search KeyRanger, Mac OSX KeyRanger malware, you'll get more information. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but the malware would encrypt document files, image files, audio files, archives, source code, database, email, and certificate files. So it would encrypt on Mac OS X systems back in 2016. 
and after it connects to the C2 server, it will get the encryption key, then start encrypting, and then it will encrypt the users folder. Then after, after that, it hits the volumes folder. This particular ransomware for Mac OS X hits over 300 file extensions all at once, wrecking things and causing disasters. Now, here's the thing. I'll actually read the recovering files part of the Linux encoder ransomware. Because of the use of the timestamp is a seed for creating the keys in the in the initialization vector IV for encryption, the encryption of trials encrypted by the ransomware is trivial given that the original timestamp information is kept intact. Researchers at Bitdefender Labs have found and exploited this weakness to recover the files without having to pay the criminals. Obviously, I'm not going to read too much of this, but the malware encrypts when it runs as root. Program puts two files into memory and the attacker's demands. For, dot forward slash readme dot crypto and forward slash index dot crypto. After that, the ransomware receives a public RSA encryption key. The malware will then start as a daemon and delete all its original files. The Trojan will encrypt files of extension and then got PHP dot HTML dot tar dot gz dot sql dot js i know what some of these file extensions are dot html is a web file like a local web page file when downloaded from the internet it's like a web page dot html tar is an archive dot gz is an archive dot sql is an sql file extension dot js is dot javascript css dot pex is no pdf is adobe pdf tgc is a archive i don't know what dot war i know what dot jar is related to ja java stuff and dot java dot class i know what dot rar is dot zip db is database file dot seven zip is seven zip archives dot doc is a document file xls is like a spreadsheet thing properties i don't know what that file extension is dot xml it's like xml code file dot jpeg dot jpg dot png dot GIF, .mov, .avi, WMV, MP3, MP4, WMA, AAC, those are all audio and video files that the malware encrypts. And it says that this malicious program encrypts files with aforementioned extensions in the following directories. It encrypts dot .home, well, it goes after not dot, but it goes after file names that have a dot. So if you're like dot .xml, it'll encrypt it, but it'll encrypt the file extension in the following directories. It goes in the dot home, root, var, lib, my SQL, var, www, etc folder, the var folder. And then after that, the malware encrypt all files from directories with the name starting by public HTML underscore www web app backup dot jit dot svn. The malware will not touch files in the following directories. Forward slash is the root directory, the main root file system. And it does not encrypt the forward slash root home folder. It won't touch SSH files or anything SSH related. It won't touch user bin. It won't touch forward slash bin. It won't touch forward slash etc forward slash SSH. It won't. All of this is on the internet through Wikipedia and other sites, but there is other additional malware known as Tesla crypt that is also defunct called. Tesla crypt. This particular malware was defeated already. It was shut down. There's CryptoLocker that's additional malware. Bleeping Computer is a website that I read, sometimes called bleepingcomputer.com. It's www.bleepingcomputer.com, written by Lawrence Abrams, and it launched in 2004, over 19 years ago. On January 29th, 2004, Bleeping Computer covers technology news and or computer help. It covers computer software, security, hardware, and operating system, general technology, things like that. So Bleeping Computer was actually created by, after Lawrence Abrams could not find existing technical support sites that could offer easy to understand instructions for his friends and family. The note, the name bleepingcomputer.com originates from sounds made by a broken computer because the user might want to curse at a computer when it does not work properly. That's how the name bleeping computer came to be. Since the crypto locker ransomware attack in September 2013 and a subsequent DDoS of the site due to its reporting on the new malware, bleeping computer has been reporting on new ransomware families as they are released. 
bleeping computer contains information about malware, cybersecurity, antivirus, things like that. Bleeping computer did get in trouble with the company called Enigma Software. The developers of an anti-malware suite called Spy Hunter filed a lawsuit against Bleeping Computer in response to a negative review of Spy Hunter alleging a campaign to damage the reputation of their company product. Bleeping Computer requested financial aid from its readers to help pay legal fees arising, arising from the lawsuit. At the beginning of August 2016, Bleeping Computer filed its own lawsuit against Enigma Software for an alleged long-running smear campaign against Bleeping Computer. The lawsuit against Bleeping Computer ended in settlement with Bleeping Computer removing Quiet Man 7 posts on Enigma Software product. Spy Hunter is an anti-malware program. It's proprietary, but it has got a shareware and it's got a registered edition. The thing with the program called Spy Hunter had terrible reviews. PC Magazine gave it a two out of five in March 2004, saying it was good at spyware detection, but complained about the performance and usability. PC Magazine gave Spyware Hunter a good rating, three out of five stars. In March 2016, the reviewer concluded Enigma Spy Hunter 4 does what it promises, eliminating active malware and killing malware at launches at startup, but competitors deliver much more. So Enigma Software is actually Spy Hunter. Spy Hunter is at currently version 5 and receives daily definition updates. Spy Hunter has a free version which allows users to scan their computer. Purchase is required to remove found malware. Yikes! Enigma Software also offers a service on its website called ESG Malware Tracker. It shows the most infected countries where Spy Hunter has detected malware. In the paid version, the user is able to receive support from a built-in help desk. Spy Hunter also has a custom fix from the Spyware help desk team. Enigma Software is still around, known as Enigma Soft, but they still offer Spy Hunter 5. They still do. That is a anti-malware program. They have filed a lawsuit against Bleeping Computer in 2016. They also have gotten malware bytes or anti-competitive behavior too. It says that the lawsuit arose after malware bytes software began targeting Spy Hunter as a potential wanted program on November 7, 2017. Enigma's case was dismissed by the U.S. District Court. Enigma appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and the court revealed or reversed the lower court's decision. A panel of judges wrote two to one that we hold that the phrase otherwise objectionable and does not include software that the provider finds objectionable for anti-competitive reasons. Despite this, Malware Bytes won the case on its merits after the Supreme Court denied their own writ of statutory on the immunity issue. It's hard to pronounce a specific word that is W R I T and C E R T I O R A R I. Controversy Spyware Hunter or Spy Hunter is often labeled as a potentially unwanted program due to its misleading results of always showing infections, including on clean computers and injects tracking cookies in users' web browser, raising concern whether it's legitimate or not. The company also floods web search results on searching for a specific threat, linking the download to Spy Hunter, even if the product is not able to remove it. I'm reading about different malware, like Linux backdoor, talking about it and malware for Linux and mostly that, but I'm also talking about rogue antivirus programs for Windows that infect Windows users called WinFixer. WinFixer is actually a fake rogue antivirus program from early 2009, and it's from Innovative Marketing Inc., but it's a type of scareware that is not commercial, registration not required. It was shut down by the United States federal government. Therefore, WinFixer is a, or WinFixer was a, was a family of scareware rogue security programs developed by Win Software, which claimed to repair the computer system problems on Microsoft Windows computers if a user purchased a full version of the software. The software was mainly installed without user's consent. Yikes. McAfee claimed that the primary function of the free version appears to be to alarm the user to paying for registration at least partially based on false or an erroneous detections. The program prompted the user to purchase a paid copy of the program. The WinFixer webpage sees the image that it said is a useful utility to scan and fix any system registering hard drive errors. It ensures system stability and performance. It frees wasted hard drive space and recovers damaged Word, Excel, and music video files. However, these claims were never verified by any reputable source. In fact, most sources consider this program to actually reduce system stability and performance. The sites went to shock in December 2008 after actions taken by the Federal Trade Commission.
In fact, I'll read more. This is an extended version of the GDO. I've covered Linux malware in the first part. The second part goes into malware for Windows and how a Linux machine can infect a Windows machine easily just by the file being on a Linux server, but the Windows server or the Windows computer connects to that server and inadvertently downloads malware to the Windows machine from a Linux machine through a server that is. There are web servers out there that do use Linux to run a web server that can also serve malware too in the, all over a long time ago. Installation methods. An example of a win picture pop-up dialog box with an opera. Even if the counts or close buttons were to click to dismiss the box, it would redirect to a win antivirus page anyway, featuring a fake system scan. Right here is, a, is actually the opera browser or the Opera browser shown here, an older version of it, where a wind fixture displays a pop up that prompts for a download, a JavaScript pop up. It says that the wind fixture application was known to inject users using the Microsoft Windows operating system was browser independent. One infection method involved the mcodec.etrojan, a fake codec scan. Another involves the use of the Vundo family of Trojans. There were a lot of computer Trojans in early 2008 to 2009 that were very dangerous. This one's called a Trojan.mcodec.e is a fake audio video codec Trojan that was used to spread malware in spring 2005. I'll read it. When visiting certain websites, in particular NSFW sites, and attempting to view a video file on the site, the user will be directed to download this software purportedly in order to allow viewing the video. Furthermore, a number of websites have been set up to misrepresent this malware as a legitimate codec, inviting the users to download the software allegedly to allow for the playback of certain audio and video, which claims to be claims to use the so-called codec. Once executed, the Trojan horse copies a program into a program files folder, changes some registry keys, and displays a shape view look for the supposed codec. Z codec reportedly changes the machine's DNS settings, monitors the user's browser, user's browsing act as adware. Some versions of the Trojan installed malware called ZLob Trojan, which in turn may lead to installation of malicious and fake security programs to Spyware Quake, Spy Falcon, WinFix, or other malware. Some variants also stored a backdoor into the infected computer. A long time ago, in early 09 and 08 and 07 and early 2005, there were fake rogue antivirus malware that would deliberately infect a computer that if you were to inadvertently, or if you were to visit an NSFW site, for example, it would infect you with a rogue antivirus program that would do a lot of damage to the computer a little bit. By damage, I mean it would block certain execution of trials, and it would make it very difficult to remove certain malware that persistently tries to fight anti-malware programs. There's actually quite a lot. Spybot Search and Destroy is one that I used to use in early 2005, 2006 called Spybot Search and Destroy that I used to use back then. I used to use that. There was Spyware Blaster, which is actually an older program that I used to use in early 2005, 2006 to block ActiveX malware, to block ActiveX malicious objects called Spyware Blaster that was common back then I used to use. There was also Super Anti-Spyware that's still around to this day, but I used to, I used to try that as well, just to track, just to search for tracking cookies that would spy on you called tracking cookies. Um, there's also Windows Live One Care, an older program that is no longer used, but it existed in 2010 for Windows XP and Windows Vista called Windows Live One Care. There's an older program called Xsoft Spy Portable Anti-Spyware that was a spyware removal software tool. PC Doctor Antivirus was an example back in 09 that would allow you to remove malware called PC Doctor or PC Tools Antivirus or PC Doctor. I used to use some anti-spyware programs. 
back in early 2006, 2007. CounterSpy is a spy removal program developed by Sunbelt Software that would remove spyware. The CounterSpy program was automatically discontinued in 2011 and is no longer ever purchased. Offered a 15 day trial version. There's Hijack This, Hitman Pro, IOBit Malware Fighter, there's MaxScan. MaxScan was a Spiral removal software developed by Secure Mac for Mac OS X. Mac OS X had a program called Mac Defender. I'm reading this off my phone as a secondary screen. I'm not doing any screen recordings from my phone deliberately. Not doing that. So basically in 2005, 2006, I used to use anti-malware programs just to ensure that there's no tracking cookies or I didn't accidentally click on a link to something I didn't know if it was safe or not without finding out the hard way later. But PC Tools was a company that made programs for Windows called PC Tools Antivirus, PC Tools Threat Fire, Spyro.com Antivirus. PC Tools got brought up by Symantec Antivirus Corporation, but it used to be its own corporation until Norton, the company Norton Antivirus, brought it out. And there used to be a PC Tools Internet Security, PC Tools Registry Mechanic, PC Tools I Antivirus for Mac, PC Tools Browser Defender for Internet Explorer and Mozilla Firefox browsers for Windows computers. There was Threat Expert, there was PC Tools Threat Fire, which is a behavioral based anti malware program. Things like that. Windows Defender is directly built into Windows 11 and Windows 10 for free. Windows Defender. There was actually a fake anti malware program called MS Antivirus, also known as Fire Protect 2009 Antivirus, XP 2008 Antivirus, 2009 Security Tool, etc. It was a scareware rogue program that was malicious. It had multiple developers behind it, but it what the symptoms of infection are if you're trying to browse Internet Explorer, if you try to browse sites through the Internet Explorer browser, the and the rogue antivirus program would block websites internally by modifying the Windows host file just to display the internet the fake Internet Explorer security warning thing right here. That right there is what the fake MS antivirus used to automatically, deliberately display to block you from browsing sites, like displaying fake warnings on legitimate sites. I'm not going to fully read all of this, but this particular malware would display a fake blue screen of death. This particular malware would just do heinous actions that would cause trouble for people back in 08, 09. Back when I was in high school, the rogue antivirus plague was like crazy, rogue antivirus software. WinFixer is an example. Virus Heat, WinFixer, Spy Sheriff. Um, most of these were rogue security software that pretend to look legit, but none of them weren't. The way you would get them is you'd inadvertently get them through a browser plugin or extension, an image screensaver archive file attached to an email message, a multimedia codec, software shared on peer-to-peer -peer networks, a free online malware scanning service inadvertently without knowing about it. Sometimes intentionally or inadvertently, but it says there's some rogue security software, however, propagate on the user's computers and drive-by downloads, which exploit security vulnerabilities in web browsers, PDF viewers or email clients to install themselves without any manual interaction. Basically, the rogue antivirus software plague was back in 2008, 2009, early 2007. WinFixer being one of those out of many of others back a decade ago. That used to be a nightmare headache for everyone that inadvertently got rogue security software. There's a list of them. There's 
ANG antivirus or ANG, there's anti-vermins, antivirus 360 opponents, MS antivirus, antivirus 2008, antivirus 2009. There's like tons of MS fake antivirus clones. There's antivirus 2010, a clone of MS antivirus, also known as antivirus-1. Antivirus Gold or antivirus GT is developed by iCommerce Solutions. It mimics the name of ABG antivirus. This is antivirus gold. That would be a fake ABG antivirus that would deliberately infect computers and be malicious. That would be harmful. iCommerce Solutions SA was a company that made a fake ABG antivirus that was designed to pose as the real antivirus of ABG. Of ABG. It discontinued antivirus gold in Q4 2005 and then quarter three and quarter four thousand eight. For Q3, Q, Q4 of 2008, that antivirus was discontinued. I'll read about symptoms of infection for this particular nasty virus. In a typical infection, the desktop wallpaper is modified and advertised and is displayed urging the user to buy antivirus gold. Upon clicking on the message, a web browser is open to point to www.antivirus-gold.com. Users have also reported that they are being directed to the site after clicking on the infected desktop. The program attempts to reinstall itself after a reboot if removed by uninstalling or system restore. Some malware would be persistent and try to uninstall or be reinstalled if the reboot or a system restore on a Windows would cause some malware to be reinstalled or reloaded back from a restore point. Which is why if you got a computer virus in early 2001, it is best to disable system restore because the virus may get inherently restored with the system restore on Windows. Hence why. MS antivirus, I've already talked about that one. There's a lot of antivirus clones, such as antivirus XP, which is part of the MS antivirus family. There's an ABG antivirus 2011 that is a fake AVG. It's not affiliated with it. There's an AV security essentials, AV security suite. There's a piece of scareware malware program. Most malicious rogue antivirus programs would be somehow involved with Adobe Flash or other Adobe components found on regular websites, and it's a drive-by download attack. Things like that. Hold on. This particular virus known as AB Security Suite was dangerous for younger users, the virus itself, known as AB underscore Security Suite. There was bestseller antivirus browser defender, a WOLA antivirus. There was Byte Defender that was a knockoff of the, leg the legitimate Bit Defender antivirus software known as Byte Defender, Byte Defender Security 2010. However, the antivirus that are rogue will automatically tend to scan your system, but they say, but this, but those fake antivirus programs would simply Display false messages. It can create a Trojan horse that can affect your system's behavior and be a form of a fake online scanner or fake video codec. It can modify windows to start. It can add malicious registry entries to the system. It'll generate multiple commercial advertisements stating that the system is injected, things like that. There was Clean Anator, all known as Max Sweeper, that was discovered in 2008 called Max Sweeper. Max Sweeper was a rogue antivirus that was downloaded through PV Software, the company that makes the rogue website, as a drive-by download or silently download with another application called Max Sweeper. Max Sweeper was a rogue antivirus that caused trouble for Mac too. Things like that. Companies like including McAfee, Symantec, and Sunbelt Software have identified the threat and have posted removal instructions on their websites. Intego, Virus Barrier, and iAntivirus are capable of removing it too. Site Advisor Division of McAfee has controversially given the site a green rating. However, Site Advisor's tests are conducted on PCs that cannot recognize DMG, the file format of MacSweeper. McAfee used to have an extension, the company called McAfee Site Advisor, that was similar to MyWatt browser extension, but McAfee Site Advisor 
will automatically warn you of a dangerous website. Sometimes McAfee Site Advisor will automatically not be up to date on dangerous websites and warn you against going to them. Watt Services is a company that started in Finland. That was a browser extension that launched in early 2006. 2000, it was initial release was 2007, but it started in 2006 as a pilot, but it got kickstarted in 2007 further. I used to use Watt. I still use the MyWatt browser extension, but things like that. And it says here, in 2016, Nord Deutsche's Runfunk, a German company investigation, revealed that Watt services sold user activity data collected from its apps and browser extensions to third parties in violation of privacy policies in the app stores on which the software was distributed. History. My Watt services or Watt services was founded in 2006 by Sammy Colvannon and Timo Ala Klimola. They're, in, they're Finnish, so it's hard to pronounce their names or last names rather. Who wrote the MyWatt software as a postgraduate at the Tamper, Tampere University of Technology in Finland? They launched the service officially in 2007 with Essa Sirio as CEO. The Sirio was replaced in November 2009, and both founders left the company in 2014. In, in 2009, MySQL founder Michael Wideness invested in Watt Services and became a member of the board of directors. Watt Services is no longer a portfolio of companies of Wideness's venture capital for OpenOcean.vc. In February 2016, Watt Services changed its name to Toe Software. Watt Services has partnerships with Mail.ru, Facebook, HP Post, Legit Script, Panda Security, Fish Tank, Global Sign, and Trusty. By November 2013, Watt Services had over 100 million downloads. Watt Services has made money by collecting browser history data from its users and selling the usage data. It said that it anonymized the data before selling it. My Watt got into trouble for selling user data a long time ago. They got into some world trouble. Some very bad trouble. After a few days after the news story aired, Mozilla removed the browser add-on from the Firefox add-on store. Watt subsequently removed its browsing tool other browsers, including Chrome and Opera. The Watt Mobile Security Protection Mobile app was removed from Google Play approximately one week after the extension. It was removed from the Google Chrome extension store. So basically, my Watt got ripped out from the Opera add-on store, got ripped out from Google Chrome extensions, got ripped out from Mozilla Firefox extensions, it got ripped off, like ripped completely off from the Google Play Store where my Watt just ripped. They took the app back off the Google Play Store briefly, directly in 2016, 2017. Well, in 2016, rather, due to the controversy by a German broadcasting station that did investigations about Watt collecting user data and selling it. The MyWatt add-on is actually a browser extension that displays a red circle for, for dangerous, green for good, yellow for caution. And I'll show you what the MyWatt extension looks like back in the early days of it, its earlier view. Hold on, I'll show you what it looks like. I'll show you what the browser add-on looks like. Let me find the Watt warning thing I uploaded on Discord to show you what it looks like. This is actually what it would look like. This is an older version of Watt that's got the red O above the word warning in bold. The older version of it. Let me show you some more examples of it. That was the earlier version of it. A version of that browser extension. Let me show you another example of it. Here's another variation of it that looks like this. Here's an old, a 2010 version that shows warning with the red O behind the word warning in bold. So that's the Watt web the trust extension looked like in 2010 that says warning with the red O behind it. And it says that this Watt warning, the site has a poor reputation. Here's what the Watt scorecard in early 2010 looked like. This is the Android app. There's an iOS version of it. 
There's an earlier revision of the WAP warning screen that is an older revision of this. Let me shine it. It's an early revision. It said, warning, this site might be dangerous. It had the red O next to the W in it, positioned to the left of it. And here's another preview of what it would look like in early 2010, early 2009. That's what it looks like with the O above the uh, warning. That is a different version of it. It says warning, a different variation of that, the older version. But this this extension used to scare the living daylights out of me. Would, if I inadvertently visit a site that has a poor reputation, it would display that saying warning, don't go to that site. And I would click off that site if I inadvertently landed on a site that I don't know if the reputation is good or not until what tells me otherwise. Let's see if I can find another generation of this. I have a variation of it that I've discovered by unpacking an old Mozilla Firefox Watt extension of it. Let's see if I can show you this. Let's see. The Watt warning icon where the walk warning screen would display the word warning. This site has a poor reputation. And that was an older browser extension, an older version of what, but there's a later revision of it. I actually have streamed on Twitch what the Watt browser extension would look like, the older version. So it would have the red O position to, a word, position to the word warning on the center part. So there'd be warning in the middle, and the red O on the left next to the W, and then a later version would have the red O above the word warning below it, and then the word warning would be over the O, so it'd be like the red O, but it'd have the words warning over it. And there was a later version with the word warning down here and the O slightly above it, as I shown earlier. The older Watt extension would block websites. If you set it to block, it would say Watt blocked, meaning the site has a poor reputation. Don't go there. Blocked the connection to the site automatically. If you have it set to display a warning overlay, it'll say warning. The site has a poor reputation in the red O above it or beside it in an earlier revision of it. Things like that. But that's how Watt browser extension would warn you of a dangerous website that you accidentally click on a link that may be dangerous and it would just say warning the site has a poor reputation like that the browser extension of what used to be a mozilla firefox only browser extension but it got available for opera the chromium blink version it got available for safari internet explorer things like that so the my Watt company released a mozilla firefox only extension first Opera came eventually on the Chromium Blink version of Opera. Google Chrome got the extension later. Internet Explorer got it later. Safari got it later. An Android app was made unofficial by someone else till MyWatt released an official Android app. Let me demonstrate to you an example of Watt in action. I'll show you what it does. Let me just go to a site called Peter Popoff as an example. So we go to peterpopoff.org. Okay, my watt isn't really warning me on anything, but I'm going to try that. I have it in the incognito tab, which doesn't work there. Let me try there. Hold on, I'm gonna try this. I should get a warning from a watt. No, apparently it does not. It used to say warning. This said it's a poor reputation, but it just says careful. It'll just say careful. The site has trust issues. Read carefully. It'll say that on the desktop version, but not on the mobile app anymore. But let me show you what the Watt app on Android would look like. There is an iOS version of it, but 
Here's the Android app of MyWatt. This is the MyWatt app that would protect you if you have the premium version. So if you got the premium, you get access to the data breach, things like that. But this is the MyWatt app for Android. It's now available. There was not an official app before. And another example of a browser extension is called Guardio. Guardio is one that's mentioned by a lot of scam baiters, such as Trilogy Media, Pierogi, um, Pleasant Green. Like a lot of those scam baiters mention Guardio as a company that will help protect your online internet life and personal identity, personal identity from being like it'll alert you to data breaches Guardio will, but it will actually warn you when you click on a malicious link, phishing link, or a scam link. It also alerts you when you get a scam email in your email inbox. Guardio will warn you if it bypasses your spam filter, things like that. But since this video is an hour long, I'm going to say this is William Armstrong signing out. I just thought I'd make a video that talks about the Linux backdoor. It's brand new. It just came out in 2023, a Linux backdoor in fixed Linux systems. I decided to talk about rogue antivirus malware. I decided to talk about MyWatt browser extension. Another browser extension I need to mention that I have used in the past is called NoScript. I'll show you. And this will be the end of this video after. This cool extension that is recommended for Chromium and Firefox is called NoScript. That is the browser or the browser extension written by Giorgio Mayon. He is a guy who wrote the NoScript. That little S is the JavaScript snake with the circle with the line going through it saying NoScript. It blocks JavaScript on any website preemptive script blocking approach that prevents exploitation of security vulnerabilities such as cross-site scripting attacks and other harmful JavaScript attacks that will cause trouble if you click on the wrong link. But other than that, this is William Armstrong signing out. You can use, you can skip around in this video if you want to hear certain aspects of the video. If you don't want to watch this whole thing, just use the YouTube bar to seek to different parts of the video you want to watch. You don't have to watch the whole thing, but this is William Armstrong signing out. See you next time. Bye-bye.